That Show, starring Joan Rivers. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Joan. Today we're doing a show on how to bring up your baby the new way, and we have with us a great pediatrician, Dr. Morrison Lev Bark, who takes care of my kids, so what more do you want? And we have another young mother, Miss Barbara Walters, so it's going to be a very good show. And um, I don't know um, how you feel. You you're married with children and all the whole thing. You know, the, you're not. You're single. So theoretically, you have no children. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all these kids today, wild, wild. But no, but you know, the greatest thrill, the first time when I had my baby and you're in the hospital and the nurse brings it in and puts it in your arms. But the nurse kind of got me a little upset because she said to me, the baby looks exactly like, like you, you know, but who cares as long as she's healthy. But, um, <laughs> yes, doesn't that hurt? It hurts. But um, it's so nice that when you have a baby in the house, I go home now, and we have a little dish, and we have a little bib, we have a little spoon, we have a little high chair. It, it's like having Mickey Rooney living with you, you know? It's really fun. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. Rooney, if he hears one more small joke, he must just, you know, bang, bang. But anyhow, uh, I, I, want, I wanted to be a very modern mother, I think, with so many books out today, you know. And all my friends, I don't know if you know this, uh, the latest thing now is breastfeeding, as I'm sure you all know. All the modern girls are reading the books. And I wanted to be modern, but I didn't want to, you know, breastfeed, so I compromised, and I wrapped the kid's bottle in a bra. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday's monologue. Yeah. <laughs> right. Here comes another. But what's your name? Nettie Rosenberg. Nettie Rosenberg. A pleasure, Nettie. A pleasure. You're a fine American and a good laugh. Thank you. Now let's see if we're gonna continue. You ready? The only bad thing is I love her. She's laughing with nothing happening. Nettie, you're whacked out. And I like it. The only bad thing, Nettie, as we both know, the only bad thing is when you're pregnant, you're a, you're a pig. You're a mess. I, no, yes. I was such a mess. I once went to the beach and a sailor took a champagne bottle and hit me. <laughs> The worst thing was, uh, I, I married a little late, and Edgar, Edgar was 40 years old when I found out I was pregnant. And you would think, 40-year-old man, first child, thrilled. Thrilled! I called him up, I was so excited, you know, I called him up as soon as the doctor said the rabbit died. I figured, all right, you know, give Edgar, <laughs> give Edgar a call. You would think a 40-year-old man, his first child, he'd be thrilled, right? Called him up, I said, guess what, I'm pregnant. He put me on hold. <laughs> To find out what you should do and what you shouldn't do with a baby, I decided to get the best baby doctor in New York, I think, because he's my own pediatrician, but he has great credentials in spite of that. He's at the Lenox Hill Hospital, he's an associate at New York Medical College, and he's one of the top practicing pediatricians in New York City, Dr. Morrison Lefbog. <laughs> and uh, for our next guest, I hate when people say, you need no introduction. But um, I think after being the star and co-hostess of the Today Show since 1961, she needs no introduction. Miss Barbara Walters. Shall we swap baby pictures? Yes, that's, yeah. a, isn't, that's a trouble. She and I meet in the elevator at NBC, and you think, you know, what are they going to talk about? And the first thing she said, remember one morning? She said to me, how do you, I, I had just been crying at home because the baby was sick. Yes. And I had to leave. And she said to me something like, um, don't you feel guilty about leaving the baby? I just took off my eyeglasses, my sunglasses, and my eyes were all red. Don't talk to me, Barbara. But it's very hard. But you know that you did what you did, which was so... Do you need show? No, they, they shoot high. What you did, which was particularly nice, Joan said in the elevator, I'll tell you about it sometime, which people do, and then they forget. And she wrote me a long and very bright sensible letter for those who don't think you're a bright, sensible mother, in which she said that she took the baby everywhere with her and that maybe her friend said, don't schlep, which I didn't know how you spell schlep until I got your letter. And that may be wrong. <laughs> I was going to say, what makes you think but that? it works out well for the baby. Is that best to do, doctor? Just, if you're a working mother? If you're a working mother, uh, there is absolutely no reason why, within limits, you can't take your child to most any place that you're going. I don't say that if you're working at 2 o'clock in the morning, that the baby has to be out. But there is no rhyme or reason 
why the child cannot fit into your life. And that brings me to the first point that I would like to bring up, and that is that the child is not the end all, that the most important person in the family is the father and the mother, and the child is just part of a family unit, and that's what pediatrics is today. Pediatrics is the family as a unit, and if the family moves in one direction, the child should move in that direction with, with the mother and the father. Because you always hear these things, especially in show business, but uh, they say, well, I know Connie Stevens, she was doing a show in New York, and she brought her baby into a rehearsal hall for three days, and everyone was saying, isn't that terrible? And I thought, that's great. The baby's there. She couldn't care as long as she's changed, and mommy holds her and gives her the bottle. Kid doesn't care that it's a rehearsal hall. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that... Kid learned to tap. That's right. <laughs> child probably stole the show from the mother. Sure, and that was the last time she brought it. No, but that's, uh, you do lose a few friends, though, I think, if you take them. There are people who don't like children. I love my baby, but I don't like babies on airplanes. If I get seated, I think, oh, my luck, I had it. You know. And sometimes in people's houses, you feel, you know, did she have to bring a child? Also, when someone brings it to the house, I think they should watch it. You know... I think just because they go to your house, don't let the child crawl and get near my French desk. It's your child. You know, you take care of it. You just stared at me in, in well, shock. Well, I'm, I'm staring at you in shock because I feel that if somebody has the, is invited to your home, they should at least have the courtesy to ask you whether they may bring their child. And if you say yes, then I would assume that being decent people, they assume the obligation of their own child in your home. This is, brings up another point. Uh, I don't believe that children should be allowed, even in your own home, to wander around indiscriminately and break up everything. I think that there's a certain amount of discipline that we teach all our children from the very, very beginning. And I think that uh, the most important thing is that certain properties do not belong to the children, and they may not be touched or handled or broken by these children. Like Daddy. Right. <laughs> like daddy. You know, when you said before, Joan, and it was, it, 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 it struck me as well because my husband was what would be known as an older father when you said that Edgar put you on hold. But we began to read all of the psychology books which said daddy should bathe the child and daddy should feed the child and he should become involved with the child and, it, and he should also change the diaper and do all of the things that mother does. And my husband said, I don't know what Edgar's like, no, I'll pick her up and I'll play with her, but I don't want to diaper her and I don't want to feed her and I know your psychology books, but, and I keep thinking this is going to be very bad for the child. And I'm very say? proud of your husband. <laughs> then you disagree with most of the psychologists. I feel that after you put in eight hours of a day, regardless of whether you're a pediatrician or an engineer or a lawyer, there is no time in the world to come home and start to change a diaper, make a formula. And one of the first things in the lecture that I give to my new mothers is to explain to them that there's m nothing more annoying than to come home after a hard day, go to wash your hands, and there in the Johnny is the baby's dirty diaper. There in the bowl where you want to wash your hands are the dirty shirts. And when you turn to the, your wife and you say, well, where are the martinis? She said, just a minute, I'm just about to make the formula. Now, this is the fastest way to make a husband very, very disgruntled with the fact that he's a father. He enjoys becoming a father because he's proved himself. He enjoys uh, reproducing in the fact that he can now show the world he has fulfilled his natural requirements. But most men are big babies, and I will say this on the air, and I'll probably get murdered <laughs> for it. And they like to be the center of attraction. I know I do in my own home. And I think, in a way, if you take this center of attraction away, you will create a certain amount of animosity, which will then be transmitted to the mother, who, when she becomes upset, will then transmit it to the baby. This is then my prime concern, because the baby suffers because of the anxiety that results from the father being unhappy, the mother then becoming unhappy, and then finally it being transmitted down to the child. So your husband though he disagrees with some of the most eminent psychiatrists is in good company because I disagree with some of them too. But what do you do? Now, with us, again, like Edgar and I, Edgar's very nervous and very, he's in the business as your husband is. But he's not very nervous. Well, I know Edgar as a father. Yes, Edgar but Edgar is a father. So but Joan is so calm. You know. Yes, Joan is so calm, but, <laughs> but Edgar is not. Like on Sundays, Edgar wants to play with Melissa for about an hour or an hour and a half, and now she's 11 months old, and I find her adorable, but she bores me a lot of times too. You know, how many times can you throw the ballie? And after about an hour and a half, he says, like, um, okay, take the kid away. I want to read the Sunday paper well, he's now. Right. So, what is the. All right, so luckily I have a nurse. Right. What does the mother do, uh, uh, is a predicament, that doesn't have a nurse? I, I think this is the 
the most, it may sound like a very ordinary question to most of the audience, but having one child, I don't know how women cope with three children, cooking, cleaning, making dinner, being nice to the husbands, making the martinis. Looking nice when he comes home and still having Babies are so time-consuming. Let's take women who have five children and All still right. do it. Send them the pill. The <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Kill my, cut my own throat. Everything, you know, mothers of today, like mothers of yesterday, have to organize, like in all businesses. Today, we have foods, we have everything to make life easier for the mother. It is very boring, I assume, sitting home with three or four children and no adult. But I assume also that if she's well organized, and that most of my mothers are, even with four or five children, they have time to do all the things so that when the husband comes home, they are clean, a good companion, and ready to have dinner with him. Well, any men don't know, but any woman that can do this, I just can't. Mm. Melissa, now, again, you read the books. Maybe again, because I was a late mother, I read everything. Don't inhibit the child and put it in the playpen. She must explore and learn her environment. Well, while she's learning her environment, everything is in that kid's mouth but food, as we know. Yeah. But um, rocks go in the mouth. Anything that is there, ex as I said, except you know what I want her to eat goes in the mouth. Ha so either you're going to put it in the playpen and she's going to scream, or you take her with you and it becomes a chore. The kid is always with me and I always say, watch it, Melissa. But if you take the playpen with you, with the child in the playpen, and you give the child something to amuse herself, the child is not interested in you. She's interested in the fact that you are there, that she hears you and she sees you. I think one of the nicest presents to give a child is to get a box and wrap it up in nicely colored paper and put a string around it and put it in the playpen with the child. The child will spend an hour and a half getting the paper and the, the string off the box and open the box or get three pots that fit in with pot holder. If you do that and push the playpen from room to room, as these women do, these children are very happy. They don't want their mother to sit and hold them every five minutes. They're bored with their mother, too. They're interested in exploring, but give them something constructive to explore and be nearby so they can see you, they can hear you. You can sit on the phone and talk to your girlfriend for an hour and a half. They couldn't care less as long as they hear the voice. I know a number of people who uh, say, I can't understand it. My child never sleeps. She only sleeps when we have a party. And sure, she sleeps because she hears all the noise of the people, which gives her the security that people are there. And so she sleeps. Does it's your baby principle. watch you on television? Speaking yes. Hearing the voice? Yes. Is yours? Any reaction? Not yet. Isn't that all? She likes you, though. Oh, that's <laughs> it. Mine what, saw me once. Sleeps through up. me. Loves you. We'll be back after this commercial, so don't go away. We're back talking with Dr. Morrison Levbarg and Barbara Walters, and you asked during commercial. I, there are the two schools of thought on, on a baby crying. Really, I guess now with all of the emphasis on, on uh, how much a child feels and knows when, when she's very young. We had some friends who said, don't ever let that child cry. A baby never cries without a reason. Always pick that child up. And then we had other friends, including uh, our the, the lady who helps me take care of the baby, who said, well, she's got to cry sometimes. And what do you think? Well. If you take, if you're referring to a newborn, a newborn has many exercises. They eat, they sleep, they defecate, and they urinate. And what else is left? Well, they, let's have say have months, form, months, they have to have some months, form of exercise. Months. So crying is part of their right. exercise. It's good for the expansion of the lungs. It's good to burn up energy so that the child will eat a little bit. I say this: if you know that your child is dry. You know that your child is not being stuck by a diaper pin. You know that your child is not hungry. And you know that your child is not suffering from gas. Let her cry for a while. It's exercise. It's good for her. Even them. if she screams hours, I know it. She's well, crying hours because she wants we don't to allow. Does you do that? Yes. Because not hours. 10 minutes, usually by 10 minutes. 20 I'm minutes would never kill a child. Oh, last night. Kill, me. kill a mother, but never kill a child. <laughs> and then you go in little faces, and the tears are kind of little nose is running. Oh. But if the little faces and the little nose is, That's me. then the baby knows exactly where she has her mother. Right. So, so anytime she her wants cry. her, down comes the little face and the little nose. But I want to ask you another thing. Maybe I'm going crazy, but Melissa's now 11 months. <laughs> yeah. I think now she's become more attached to me. Like before, strangers would come in the house, there wasn't all this. <laughs> She is like you know she would be happy. Now she's much more aware when I'm not there. Is that right? Definitely and Edgar well. says to me that's bad. The child's becoming more attached. She's becoming spoiled. I think because she's becoming older and she knows who's family and who isn't. But awareness is not necessarily being spoiled. In Hear other that, words, Edgar? Wherever you are. <laughs> uh, 
the, the question is, the child now is starting to associate people with certain things. She's associating your girl with being fed, uh, being uh, kept dry, etc., dressed. She associates you with good times, also with feeding and dressing, but you are her mother, and she's now starting to, to get that. Edgar's her father. He's the man who comes in on Sunday for an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> no, he's uh, much more with her. Oh, that. okay, more than that. I'm just but, the, but the essence of the, so am I. But the essence of the story is the child now begins to know. The child knows that when she rides up Park Avenue and ends up in my office uh, and feels the, the, the paper against her bare behind, that she's going to get a shot, and she starts to cry. Why? She doesn't cry because she hates me, really. <laughs> well, no. She cries because she knows that she's going to be hurt in this situation. I'm sure that if you undressed her and put her on newspaper at home and heard a voice similar to mine, she'd cry too. Yeah. It's association. What about certain habits? Another thing, again, from the books, every time I pick up a book and it says, every day the child must have a green vegetable, a yellow vegetable, meat, fish. Well, you know, I get hysterical. My child will not eat. I stand, and literally, I'll come up from the, uh, what do you call it, studio. And uh, yeah. I will stand. I don't trust the nurse. I will strain it myself or mash it myself. And I go out and I buy the chop, and I stand there, and I chop it up. And she goes, <laughs> like that. And that's it. And I starve her. It, can a child grow and be healthy and just have mainly milk and vitamins? It's a well, very bad hysterical Milk thing. and vitamins are not an adequate diet. Yeah. I mean, let's face that. But let's also face the fact that in America, the two big problems are both ends, the mouth and the other end. And if the American feels that the child is constipated or the child doesn't eat, these are the two problems that pediatricians hear the most about. Now, as far as eating is concerned, there isn't a child that I know of in all the years that I've been in practice who voluntarily starved himself to death. And I'm sure there isn't a pediatrician who will ever say that he knew a child who starved himself to death. A child will eat what it wants to eat. But does your child eat the right things, Barbara? Yes, but I just What's the right thing? Oh. The right thing shouldn't be ice cream and cake, which my child, just but like the mother... But you don't give ice cream and cake three times a day. Well, I try everything toward the end. Yeah, and it always ends up... <laughs> yeah, I do. Mine is younger than yours. My baby's only six and a half months, so, so it she's has still... No choice. You but just I, now I know where... Mine has just learned to go... <laughs> That's, and that's, I, I was that's taking it very personally that's, for that's a while. Part of I learning. Learning. First of all, they like to go <laughs> all over me because they like the learning. noise. Number two, they like the expression on your face when you're full of spinach. <laughs> Number three, this is a game to them. Then all of a sudden they decide, well, if they do that, this is a form of rejection of certain foods. So therefore they realize that by doing that, they, they're trying to tell you, please don't give me this. Give me something that I like Should better. you force... I mean, mine sometimes sure, won't drink like milk, so I'm... The floor. Yeah. Well, not even when she doesn't spit up. I mean, I'm but used to cleaning going up. To. Should I make her take the bottle? If you force mouth? it, you're going to clean it up off the floor five minutes later. So just let her... When a child pushes food away, it's pushing it away because it cannot say no. But it's trying to warn you that it's going to do something if you persist. If you persist, you'll clean it up. You know, if you don't persist, you we won't. We found a game last night. She's found it. It's called You Feed Me, I Feed You. But right. it worked. We had chicken, and so she was putting it in my mouth. So I said, all right, now I put it in your mouth. And that's how I got the chicken into it. I was, I'm going to gain like 100 pounds in a month. How do you feel about puree of lamb? And all over my dress? <laughs> Great. <laughs> we'll be right back with Morris and Lefbach, MD, and Barbara Walters, mother. We're back talking with Dr. Lev Barg and Barbara Walters. What about toilet training? Now, my baby's getting to the point, she's 11 months, and, and I was in England recently, and they, the English nannies claim three months. Yes, very early. The English nannies claim that they've never had a dirty napkin after three months. And napkins, of course, are the English word for diapers. And this is true. The English people are very, very astute about training early. And what they do is they watch their children. And the minute the child starts to grunt and groan, she comes running with the little potty and sticks it under the child. And the child goes, and she says, you see, the child is trained. The only one who's trained is the nanny. <laughs> you must listen to the grunt and groan and go racing over. Toilet training is a natural phenomenon that children will do at different ages depending on the child. Of course, uh, most men and women feel that their children should be trained very early so they can get into nursery school and do everything, you know, the way they want to. But children will train at their own rate. Normally around 11 or 12 months of age, you just start with toilet training. What do you mean by just start? You go like, uh-oh. Like you, you say, uh, <laughs> You've done it approximately again. <laughs> when does the child go, have a bowel movement, which is the first part of, of toilet training. And that's will say after lunch. So that what you do is you have two types of uh, uh, training tables. You have either the potty that you put on the chair or the potty that you put on the john. 
And many people prefer the one that's down on the floor so the child can't fall, because it's great to put them up there and have them land up on the floor. Uh, so you put them on after that meal. The child goes, you go, hooray, and everybody cheers, and <laughs> it doesn't go, and it goes in its pants. Nobody says anything, and this is the beginning of, of toilet training. Or there are people and pediatricians who believe that you put them on for five minutes after each meal. I will tell you my secret remedy for teaching boys. I really shouldn't tell my secret, but to teach boys to stand up to go to the bathroom, and that is... Uh, very hard because most mothers are very upset when their boys are two and they, they want to sit down like little girls and they say, what can I do? I say, well, you have to send them to the bathroom with their fathers because it's a little hard to go with their mothers. And you ask them, you tell them to cut out round pieces of cardboard and paint them different colors and throw it in the john and they stand there with their fathers and it's called hitting the center of the ring. <laughs> And if you do that, it works. it works. Make sure you have two steps for the child to stand up because he's liable to fall on the john while he's trying. Do you think that the toilet training is as traumatic as, as Freud has made us all believe? Toilet training is only traumatic if it becomes an issue in a family. If everybody sits around waiting for the child to go to the john, it's traumatic. Wait. I think he's going. Then everybody takes him to the bathroom, and everybody sits. The mother puts on the floor show. The father comes running in. Everybody cheers. Then it's challenging. Otherwise, if not, if not, I want to thank Dr. Vars and Left Bark on behalf of all those mothers of two-year-old boys. And I also want to thank Bob. Will you come back again, and we'll get some I'm more. I'm not going to get a bill for this today. No, 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 no. It's so great. darling. No, it was just thank great. You, it's so oh, informative. Please. I can't tell you. And what else can I tell you? If you have any ideas for shows, write in care of NBC New York. And we'll try to work it in, because we're always looking for something to talk about. If you'd like to see the show when you're in New York, write Joan Rivers tickets, Box 850, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. Miss Rivers' guest, stay at the Hotel Roosevelt while in New York. <laughs>